recording, we will discuss innate immunity. The cells involved in your innate immunity include phagocytes like macrophages, neutrophils, and eosinophils. We also have non-phagocytic cells, including natural killer cells, dendritic cells, basophils, and mast cells. Remember, this is our non-specific immunity, so regardless of what pathogen we might come into contact with, the response by these cells will be the same every time. So your macrophages are usually the first cells to respond to cellular injury or tissue damage. These kill pathogens um, by using chemicals like hydrogen peroxide, um, which you know, you've probably heard of hydrogen peroxide, and hypochlorous acid. And you might not have heard of that, but that's the active component in bleach. So we know that bleach is used to, you know, um, sanitize things. So it's pretty good at killing pathogens. Now, macrophages can also have a cytotoxic effect. Okay, so remember, cyto just means cell. Um, how are we going to do that? They are going to secrete substances directly onto a pathogen, um, and then those substances can start to degrade the pathogen from the outside, or perhaps we can um, poke a hole in the pathogen and burrow in. But this is really to help um, destroy pathogens that are too large to ingest. And so in our image, we can see that the uh, the tan cell, this is the big macrophage, and it's, it's large, right? It's like, this is a big cell. A little tiny bacterium. Look at them, little tiny, okay? But there are other pathogens that we can come into contact with that even this macrophage cannot phagocytize the pathogen completely. It can't eat it. And so we have to have another way to destroy those pathogens. And so this is just that other way of doing that. We can secrete substances onto the plasma membrane of those cells um, and start to destroy them that way. And now last but not least, macrophages function as antigen presenting cells, APCs. Okay? Um, you're gonna see that over and over, APC, APC, APC. So what are we talking about? Um, antigen presentation, okay? Presenting an antigen. We are going to display a foreign antigen on the plasma membrane of the macrophage. Okay, so for example, this macrophage, they're, they're, it's eating these little bacteria, okay? Once the macrophage ingests these bacteria and destroy them, they are going to pick out the little pieces, the little antigens, that make this bacteria very recognizable. And then they are going to take those foreign antigens that come from those bacteria, and they are going to display them on their plasma membrane. Now, why are they doing that? because they are signaling to T cells, okay, it's a signal. They're saying, hey, T cells, if you see this antigen, okay, you need to recognize that there's something not right about it. It's a foreign antigen, it's from a bacteria or virus, wherever we got the antigen, okay? When you see this antigen, that is your signal to attack that cell, okay? So T cells become activated Okay, when they come into contact with these antigens on the plasma membranes. Um, and it also increases the activity of macrophages as well uh, by secreting certain substances, uh, signaling substances. That part is a positive feedback loop, and so we just recruit more and more uh, macrophages um, to make sure that we're consuming all of the bacteria or um, damaging all of the pathogens that are in that area. Um, but this whole idea of antigen presentation, showing T cells um, what antigens to be on the lookout for, that's actually really important. And again, you're gonna see APCs come up quite a few times. Now neutrophils, um, also phagocytes. Um, we're gonna ingest pathogens directly, or we could use chemicals like the hydrogen peroxide and hypochlorous acid we just mentioned. Neutrophils also have lysozymes so just another chemical used to destroy pathogens. Um, now, neutrophils can ingest lots of types of cells, but their favorite is bacteria, okay? So think of it as like a favorite snack, okay? So you, you have lots of snacks, you can eat lots of things, but this is their favorite snack, bacteria, okay? They also can release cytotoxic components that they're holding within their granules 
um, and this helps to damage the plasma membrane of the pathogen. This is similar to how macrophages work. Okay, we just mentioned using the cytotoxic substances to destroy pathogens um, from the outside, and so this is very similar. Okay, um, now neutrophils tend to live in the blood, and so they have to be recruited to the site of damaged tissues. How are we going to recruit them? We have chemical signals that um, are sent out into the blood, and when those signals reach the neutrophils, um, they're like, hey neutrophils, there's some damaged tissue, we might have some infection going on. Um, so the neutrophils exit the blood, and they will go to the site of tissue damage, and if there's any bacteria there, they will um, chew them up, spit them out. Now, eosinophils, our last granulocyte. Um, these are very specific with their targets. They tend to be involved in parasitic worm infections. Um, so this image, this helminth. Um, a helminth is a worm, specifically in our case, this is going to be a parasitic worm. Um, normally, we don't necessarily come into contact with a lot of parasitic worms, um, which I am personally grateful for. But if we do, Here's what happens. You will notice in our image, these eosinophils are covering all sides of this helmet worm, and they are releasing these granules, okay, or the contents of their granules, I should say. Those chemicals are meant to destroy this worm from the outside in, okay. Um, if it's not um, completely destroying it by itself. At the very least, it's making it easier for other immune cells to come in and help get rid of the worm itself. And you'll also see we've got some antibodies down here that are getting involved also. So that's what eosinophils do. They kill worm infections. Now, natural killer cells. Um, these are pretty unique. They have the ability to recognize cancerous cells in cells that have been infected with specific types of viruses. Um, that doesn't necessarily sound super remarkable, but remember this is part of your non-specific immune system. Okay? So they cannot recognize specific antigens, and yet they are somehow able to recognize cancer cells. So that's pretty, that's pretty cool. Um, these are cytotoxic, okay? So they're gonna release the substances onto the target cell um, and kind of kill them from the outside in, right? And we've mentioned that a couple of times. Um, they secrete microbial cytokines, okay? Cytokines are those chemicals that are helping recruit additional immune uh, cell responses. And they activate macrophages, okay? To get more phagocytosis happening. But what have we not mentioned specifically? Um, the natural killer cells aren't really the phagocytes themselves. They're recruiting phagocytes, okay, the macrophages, um, and they can destroy from the outside in, but they're not really the ones that are gonna go eating any bacteria that they come across. Dendritic cells function as antigen presenting cells, as APCs that we've mentioned. So in our picture, we have our mature dendritic cell, this little green component, and this might be a little small for you, um, this little green antigen. Okay, We have gotten this antigen from maybe a bacteria that we've come across at some point, and we are presenting, we are presenting it to this T cell, and so now this T cell knows that if it comes across this green antigen on a cell somewhere in the body, that that cell is probably a foreign invader and that T cell now knows to attack whatever uh, or wherever it finds that antigen. Okay. Now, basophils, um, these are also granulocytes. These granules contain inflammatory mediators, okay, so histamine. Um, when basophils release that histamine, obviously those inflammatory mediators are gonna mediate inflammation um, you get a lot of those symptoms um, that we might not be super fond of, um, especially think about like when you have a, having problems with your allergies, okay? So your runny nose, things like that. Um, 
the, the basophils, the histamine specifically, is triggering some of that uh, in inflammation reaction. Um, so we can oftentimes, if you suffer from allergies, you have probably taken allergy medicine, right? We don't, we don't like to suffer from those, those symptoms, the runny nose and the sneezing and things like that. So one of the types of allergy medicines out there, um, they're known as antihistamines. Okay, so they can kind of calm that inflammatory response down. Now, basophils um, tend to travel in the blood, but they have a cousin, they have a mast cell, okay, um, that work very similarly with the release of the histamine, but they just live in a different place. They live in your mucous membranes instead, okay? Um, so again, when you're thinking allergies, allergic responses, the, the runny nose and all those yucky symptoms, you're probably dealing with your basophils and your mast cells. Oops, uh -oh. skipping things. Okay, did that one. Okay, here we go. Um, antimicrobial proteins, so cytokines. We've thrown that word around a couple of times. Let's make sure we understand the purpose. So these are proteins that help enhance immune responses in different ways because we have different categories of cytokines. We have tumor necrosis factors, we have interferons, and we have interleukins. Now, we are going to talk very, very, very briefly about these three subcategories. And we are basically just mentioning them. Um, these things can get very complicated because even though these are subcategories, Okay, of cytokines, you have different TNFs, you have different interferons, you have different interleukins. So you could have 20 or 30 different types of interleukins, okay, with different functions. So these are just very general uh, observations of these cytokines. So tumor necrosis factor attracts phagocytes um, when we have infections, and it also increases the activity. Um, and stimulates the release of additional cytokines. So some of your TNFs could maybe recruit interferons that then um, carry out their own functions. Speaking of interferons, these are produced in response to intracellular agents, okay? So pathogens that have infected our cells, so viruses and some bacteria, okay? Anything that's managed to get into our own cells their main job is to inhibit or interfere with uh -huh, interfere with replication okay inside that host cell so if the va uh, the virus or the bacteria is unable to replicate eventually um, it will die and will not be able to infect any more host cells and last but not least we have interleukins these stimulate the production of neutrophils by your bone marrow they stimulate natural killer cells, um, and they trigger the produce, uh, production of interferons as well, and then they also help activate T cells. So interleukins do quite a few different things, and you really do have um, 20 or 30 something different interleukins, and they all play a different role in one of these processes. So again, we're just giving brief overviews, okay? Brief overviews. Now, inflammation, we've mentioned it a couple of times. Um, you can see that in our picture we have damaged a tissue, we've got a splinter or something like that. With that comes the possibility of not only damaged cells, but we could also um, have bacteria that entered our wound as well. But at the very first, we've got mast cells that are releasing the histamine, the inflammatory responses, and so you can see We've got our redness, okay, and our heat. We're swelling up, okay, so this is getting bigger. Um, it's very painful also because you have, you know, you poked a hole in yourself. That is painful. Um, and we are also going to recruit other cells to the site of infection. So here's a monocyte and some neutrophils come in to see if there's any bacteria to, to chew up, things like that. So we're going to have a, quite a few things going on. So not only do we have the mast cells okay, um, that are releasing the inflammatory mediators, we've got macrophages coming to see if there's any bacteria to chew up. Cytokines are going to recruit other um, immune components if necessary. 
The neutrophils are also going to come help with phagocytosis if necessary. And all of these players in the immune, or excuse me, in the inflammation response, we're going to get some classic symptoms. Redness, heat, edema, pain. Okay. Um, sometimes, sometimes, we also end up with a fever. Now, if we do end up with a fever, this could be a critical warning sign that inflammation is occurring somewhere in the body. Um, most people have had a fever at some point in their life, and you have kind of know the symptoms to associate with a fever. But why are we saying that it could be a critical warning sign? Um, well, if your fever gets too hot, if you get too hot, you could start doing some serious damage to the proteins in your body. Um, and once you damage your proteins, it's not always easy to fix that. And so if your fever gets too bad, then your medical team is going to definitely jump into action to bring that fever down sooner rather than later. Now, when we do get a fever, how, what are we doing? Like, how are we getting so hot? Well, you have what are called pyrogens. These are substances that are released from damaged cells or even certain bacteria. And these pyrogens are acting on your good old hypothalamus. Now your hypothalamus does 12 million things, but one of them is to act as your internal thermostat, okay? Because we really like to be at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So how is it that your body is able to get above that 98.6 and sometimes even sustain that fever for a while? Here's what happens. Those pyrogens, okay, have basically reset your thermostat. They have tricked your hypothalamus and those pyrogens are like, you know what, um, we have moved your thermostat and it's now at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So your hypothalamus is like, well, we need to be at 100, but we're only at 98. So that normal body temperature seems too low. What happens when your body temperature is too low? We are cold, right? We think we're cold. Well, what happens when your body thinks it's cold? It shivers to try to warm me back up. Well, you weren't technically cold, but now you're shivering, so what's gonna happen? Well, now your body's gonna get even hotter. So that's gonna bring your overall body temperature up. That's where that fever comes in, okay? So if you've ever had a really bad fever, you have probably shivered, which is technically gonna make you even warmer, and that fever is gonna continue. Now, if we give you medications or your body is naturally fighting off those pyrogens, eventually your fever will break. And one of the things that we do to bring down your body temperature is we're going to sweat and we're going to dilate your blood vessels. And the sweating and the dilation of the vessels, all of that is going to help bring that body temperature back down to the 98.6. We've gotten rid of those pathogens, we've reset our thermostat to good old 98.6, and we're going to stay there.